Okay, well, first of all, we wanted to start by thanking all the Pop Tech folks for making this experience, even so far, amazing, especially since we had just come from trying to get flights to Ethiopia that took weeks and weeks and weeks and literally had our flights within like 10 minutes from Pop Tech. It was a miracle. Uh, we also wanted to thank, uh, a special thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation who have supported our work through the Bellagio uh, Center Fellowship that we both had in uh, just in April. So that just happened and has been a wonderful opportunity for us to elaborate on the work that we're going to be talking with you about today. And then finally, we wanted to thank each one of you for bringing your open minds and hopefully challenging and collaborative uh, points of view so to this conversation that we're all having that's uh, extremely important, much needed, especially the innovative leading edge init initiatives that hopefully will come out of something like this. So thanks to you all too. And as a bringing in a piece of the human dimension of resilience, Lori and I are each going to talk to you just a little bit about how we even got into it. Because, and for me, it came from the uh, kind of juxtaposition of two very interesting, one catastrophic event, which is in 2001, where I had just, I participated for a month in a work practice program at the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And on the last day of that retreat, um, these words were offered to us. And they go, let me respectfully remind you Life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly and opportunity is lost. Awaken, awaken, take heed. Do not squander your life. The next day was September 10th, 2001, and I flew back to my office and home in Washington, DC. And I think you know what happened then on September 11th of 2001. And I had been running a women's psychotherapy group that very morning and had just ended the group with those words that I had learned at Upaya as the first plane was hitting uh, the Twin Tower. And something, I don't know, those of you born in the United States or living in the United States, I don't know if that event had an effect on you, but it completely changed my life. And I felt as if I was literally jettisoned out of my comfort zone, and a very comfortable life, by the way, into some, a path that just felt like I had been plucked out of my comfort zone and placed on a path that was living my soul's true purpose. If you can understand sort of the, the bigness of that, that's how it's felt. And so what ended up happening is a colleague and I started, Elaine Miller Karras, started a nonprofit, the Trauma Resource Institute, where we developed a neurobiological approach to self-regulation. And we took that model to situations of catastrophic trauma around the world. And we're going to be talking to you a little bit then today about how we're adapting that model for larger systems. That's my story of the beginning. And yes, my life changed forever as well. Turns out, actually, that uh, Lori and I met several years later. We were introduced by Gary Trudeau. And uh, yeah, things get weirder, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary has just been really such a, um, such a brother and friend in this work. Uh, he's made it possible to develop, to feature these uh, stabilization skills on a, an app for iPhones and droids. iChill is the name of that app. Uh, but that carries us a little far afield. Let me come back to really what my, the context for what brings me to this work. I had the privilege of serving with the, some of the best human beings on earth in my th almost three decades in uniform. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, and their family members. And in that time, particularly the last decade after 9-11, and in my position as being on point for the unseen wounds of war, and serving as the founding director for the Defense Centers of Excellence for Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury, I had the, the experience of witnessing at close hand 
how large institutions can absolutely come forward and bring out the best in people, build resilience, do things that are amazing, make the impossible look easy. When it comes to complicated challenges, nobody better than the military. I also had the opportunity to witness at close hand what happens also within large systems when they struggle to grapple with the challenges of a nonlinear and complex world. And I realized that it wasn't enough to focus on the downstream manifestations of that struggle, whether it be epidemic suicide rates, whether it be sexual assault, whether it be atrocities committed, but that we had to find a way to get upstream <coughs> and to make a dent in the culture of those systems. So that's what I bring. That's the urgency, the passion that I bring now to working with Lori to bring this model of social resilience and apply it within systems, groups, communities of all sizes. So a little bit about uh, those early years. You'll see in these next three photos examples of resilience from our work with catastrophic trauma. This first picture is of an, an internally displaced persons camp in Kenya uh, where people were sent and following the post-election violence a few years ago. And this particular camp, people had pooled their this meager uh, allowance that the government gave them uh, for being relocated, they pooled that money and they actually purchased the land that the camp sat on. And so what we saw as we worked in these camps is in that one particular camp was the only camp we saw anything growing. People were starting to plant gardens. It was a, it, a great example of resilience. And in these next two photos are of Haiti, where you see the complete destruction. We've been there now for two years working in Haiti. Complete destruction in the background and people, you know, coming back to their livelihoods, selling vegetables in the market. And so this notion that uh, pretty much anywhere I've ever been in the world where there's been either a human caused or a natural disaster, that inevitably we begin to see the human resilience. We're all wired with it. In case you didn't know that, we're born neurologically wired for resilience because our system is survival based and we have all kinds of of wiring that helps promote our, not just our survival, but even our capacity to thrive if we just know how to use that. And I'm calling that actually a, an untapped natural resource. <laughs> we think of natural resources as, as existing outside of our bodies, but actually we have wonderful ones inside the body. And so what we've done in our model is use neurobiological research to develop a set of skills that help people learn how to self-regulate. But not just that, we consider it a sort of self-directed neuroplasticity. Because the, you've probably heard that saying, the neurons that fire together <laughs> wire together. And what we're finding is that if we can help people apply skills for self-regulation, in fact, that's what gets wired in. And it's been very exciting to see what happens in settings where people aren't operating in such a resilient way. And so with, uh, with that sort of as the foundation, working with catastrophic trauma, we in our Bellagio Center um, fellowship wanted to translate working in a sort of trauma-focused way to working in a more peak performance-oriented way with organizations and systems of all size. So we put together, I mean, the wonders of these Bellagio fellowships is people come from around the world Amazing. and they're, they're across disciplines. And so in our working group that we put together at Bellagio was a wonderful group of people and you can see the definition, I'm not going to read it to you, but the bottom line is that all of us agreed that it's that human dimension that's been the missing link. How do we create resilience? Not just create it, how do we bring it out, that natural capacity for resilience, how do we bring it out and amplify it, not just in individuals but in the systems that they're a part of? In part of our work in Bellagio, we uh, 
we spent a lot of time talking about systems of systems, and this draws from some of the domains that were mentioned earlier today, where it's not just enough to put the human dimension at the center, but humans exist in relationship within oneself, with each other, within families, groups, and communities, but they also exist, of course, embedded in systems, whether it be the financial capital system, ecological, the environmental, uh, the physical infrastructure, and so yes, these silos that were mentioned, the domains of uh, resilience, they can't just stack on top of each other, they can't just stand in isolation. We have to find ways of interconnecting in this system of systems. And this gets to another way of showing this, that you know, what's in the balance? Yes, on the one, on the one side, we have unprecedented pressures but the good news is that we have all of these system of systems that we can make investments in. Now, earlier this morning, Andrew had mentioned that resilient systems are those that are characterized by at least four properties. They're robust, they're redundant, they're resourceful, and they're rapid. But the question that I have is, what happens when the state that a system is bouncing back towards is in fact undesirable. Poverty, highly <coughs> resistant, as are toxic institutions, not to mention political tyrants and classroom bullies. So it seems to me that we have to develop the, cap the capacity to make judgments. Is this a situation where in fact it's desirable to bounce back, or do we need to figure out ways of bouncing forward? And so my challenge to myself, and each of us here for this uh, uh, dialogue, this conversation, this crucible of collaboration, uh, my question is, how can we invest in the kind of, let's say, a, a deepening, a broadening global jet stream of consciousness, collaboration, creativity, and courage, yes, courage, that every one of us <coughs> needs who has the audacity to take on the status quo. Because after all, Andrew, the, the protectors of the status quo have a set of four R's of their own. They're resistant. They exercise ridicule. They retrench and retribution mm -hmm. is common. So, we are all in this together. We can't do it alone. We need backup. One of the, uh, the next two graphics that I'm going to be showing you on these slides, we've used around the world um, as a way of teaching people about the system that we target when we work with individuals, which is the autonomic nervous system of the human body. And that autonomic nervous system influences every organ of the body so that when we begin to bring balance back to the rhythm, which when we're in a resilient zone, you can see that there's a, if we can get it to work, we, that there is a charge, let's get it. There's the charge of excitation and then a release and a charge and a release. And that rhythm, when it stays within a certain bound, promotes integrative functioning for everyone meaning that you're thinking, you're feeling, and you're sensing, and sensation is the focus of our intervention, are all congruent with each other. And people learn to track that pattern of charge and release. They begin to be able to describe it, and by being able to be aware of it, they have more control over it. And we teach them very specific skills for that. But now what we're doing is we're applying the autonomic nervous system model that's within us as individuals to the nervous system of collectives, whether it's the nervous system of a community, of a region, of a multinational corporation, of many nations together. And what we know, so here's the resilient zone, and we're not intentionally, we're not calling it a comfort zone. <clears throat> a really wise person once told me that if you're in the middle of your comfort zone, you're taking up too much space. Mm -hmm. I have always remembered that, and try not to get too uh, solidly grounded in my comfort zone. So it's not so comfortable always there, but you're capable of responding rather than reacting to what life is dishing out, or at least returning to it when it's bumped you out, and this is what it looks like. So here's our resilient zone. 
Here are the, what we're calling now, relentless demands that come from the kind of fast-paced, interconnected world we live in. It bumps us out of that natural rhythm, our resilient rhythm, into states that can be characterized at a collective level on, as hyperarousal, a lack of compassion. There's a lot of emerging research about the impact of being dysregulated on people's capacity for empathy and compassion. And whenever we've gone into a disaster zone, we say to people, these skills can help reduce the level of violence in your community because when you're inside that zone, you're much less likely to feel fear-driven reactivity, aggression and violence, moral distress, which is a huge issue. Um, or correspondingly hypoarousal, which we can also see in collective groups of isolation and apathy, social fragmentation, civic disengagement. So what we're trying to do now is where we used to describe these at the individual level, we could put up in the hyperarousal box pain, anxiety, irritability, and rage. We're translating those concepts into what they look like at a collective level. Same with the hypoarousal. So what is the missing link in this ongoing dialogue of resilience? Our work has informed us that it's not only the human dimension, but it's, it's specifically the neurobiology that undergird and supports our ability to, to live as our best selves and to form networks of grounded and embodied leaders who can then participate in building and growing uh, global resilience that's sustainable, that's scalable at all levels. You know, we'd, we'd like to underscore that, that last point. Uh, some of you have seen the, the little sign uh, that says, you know, culture eats strategy for lunch any day. It's hard for me to say as a military officer <laughs> that anything overrides strategy, but in fact, culture is the key it must be the target of our interventions and the focus, really, the measure of our success ultimately, mm -hmm. that upstream, that upstream uh, domain. Plus, I think a, a concept that I came across before I went to Haiti the first time um, was in a book about Paul Farmer. It's not his concept, but it's called Appropriate Technology. If you haven't heard of it, it's a, it's a wonderful concept that some say came from Gandhi which is that we want to equip people with skills. We want to equip people with the means. They're not saying skills. Skills are what we're doing, but I consider it appropriate technology. Equip people with the means to be independent from the systems over which they have no control. And so in our individual level model, what we've wanted to do is equip communities, individuals and then communities, with self-regulation skills that they can teach to each other, that they can use in their families. Children can learn them. They're very simple, even though they're very profound. And taking that appropriate technology can mean that in settings where either there's a huge stigma in help seeking, or there are no resources for help seeking, which is most of the places that we work, um, bringing some kind of skill set to people that truly does help rewire their nervous system. And what we end up seeing is much more collaboration, much better self-advocacy, more social action uh, that's constructive. And now then, we're taking that knowledge and that set of skills and embedding it in a kind of collective intelligence approach that can build these sorts of attitudes and power, really, into organizational settings, into communities, and ideally globally. I mean, we are, we're shooting for the very top. Well, understanding that it's not just about shooting for the top, it's about shooting for change, and change that's positive, because actually, you know, change for change's sake isn't necessarily the goal. Better is better. And so it's about linking top-down and people-up leaders into networks who can then develop a common shared lexicon and skill set and way of relating to this world of constant disruption. And so to close our, our presentation, we thought we'd close with a <coughs> quote and three questions. The quote comes from Bonnie Raitt, her song, Thing Called Love. 
we only see the world we make. We only see the world we make. Three questions. What are you seeing and making? What is it that we together can envision? Envision a world as it might be. And how? How can we make it so? Time is not our friend. Let's get after it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.